we are going to proceed as follows. First, I'm going to basically give you a, a status update because I think that, uh, I mean, a lot of things happened last year. We have worked very hard. And I think it is important, we think it is important to give people, to give you a clear picture of where we are uh, with the BPF support in GCC. Uh, so that will be the next, the first part that they will do then. The second part will be the, the next work, which is like what is next. As you will see now, we have reached a very important milestone with the, in this project. So then after that, what is the, uh, the next items that we will be working on? And then to close it, to close the activity, we will talk about a few uh, other issues and other open questions. Now, uh, as we did in the last LSFMM, what we are going to do is that we are going through some material and interleave with the material there are some explicit and particular questions to you that we need answers to and that we would like to discuss. We don't have to discuss it everything in this hour, but at least you know, I mean, we would like to uh, to clarify certain little points here. So let's get on with this. Um, <clears throat> so um, what has happened on the port? Well, since a few months ago, so to say. So in Binutils, Binutils is the CNU pa package that covers assembler, linker, um, object dump, read elf, all those utilities. Um, we decided to rewrite the port, the BPF port, at the end of 2023 to stop using CGen. CGen is the, is the CPU generation, is some infrastructure that some ports in Binutils do use. Why we decided to, rewrote the, to rewrite the port? The answer is that uh, CGen is nice, it is abstract, it allows you to write a description of a CPU and then it generates this assembler, assembler from in and everything, but BPF is so weird in many different ways that torturing CGen, right? Um, so it will actually it could actually support BPF properly was proving very challenging, and basically we prefer to just rewrite it. Uh, now we have a manually written implementation of assembler opcodes and this assembler, which is simpler, it's more flexible, it's better. Okay, so something else that happened was that we completed support for the pseudo C syntax, assembly syntax of BPF, e everywhere, in assembler and disassembler. And also we met GCC to actually generate it properly, so that is finished, is completed. We also added support for the, B for the BPF version for instructions. I think we are not missing any of them, by trap instructions, all the long autos, the sign new instructions, and so on. Then we also added support in the assembler to perform some relaxation on, um, on jumps, which are exactly the same relaxations that the Clang assembler does, performs, which is the two that you can see there, the jump with display 60, 16 and so on. Um, there is a, a, no, a new option in the BPF assembler that you can use to disable the relaxation, which is enabled by default, but in case you would want to do that. Related to the above, to this relaxation, uh, we observed that the Clang assembler was not relaxing uh, w um, jumps instructions when those instructions got immediate as arguments. Switch, um, uh, so then we implemented the same. So this is what is written there here. Oh, I will be sending this file to the BPF list after this uh, talk, obviously. Okay, I have to go fast because we don't have that many time much time. Um, also, mm, after a short interaction in the BPF mailing list, we added support for this, um, for, for using a few bits in the E flux header in the ELF, in the ELF uh, you know the ELF file, it has a, in the header of the ELF file, there is a 64 bits integer that are, is supposed to be used for platform specific flags. So basically what we are doing is that we are encoding in some of in a few of those bits the version of the BPF CPU for which the object got compiled, and we are using this uh, in the disassembler mainly. So the disassembler it knows when to show you when it finds, for example, a B4 instruction, it can show you oh this is S S uh, is what S diff for example, or this is an unknown instruction. So that's it, and we. 
uh, we adapted 3DELF from Inutils to actually well show you like sensible things like here, like the flux is BPF CPU version 4. Now, the first question I have is, we sort of agreed to this in the mailing list, so I don't know if Clank uh, supports this at this point. No. no. Do you have any objection to this? No. Okay, cool. This is going to be shorter than I thought. <laughs> nice. So, um, something else that we did is uh, we removed some BPF instructions that for some reason we thought existed, but they didn't, um, which are those two here. And actually, we realized about this because of some thread I, see, I think that Dave started in, uh, in the list in part of the standardization issue. Well, we removed those instructions. I think Clank doesn't support them either, so because the verifier doesn't support them. Okay, so this is for the binutils part. Now, the compiler part. Um, okay, so the infamous bpf-helpers.h file that you all liked so much has been removed finally from the compiler. We needed to ship this because um, for a long time, GCC was not able to cope with all the stuff that came with the BPF underscore helpers.h from the kernel. But now we can. So we removed this from the distribution upstream. And it felt quite good. Uh, we completed the core implementation in GCC. Uh, we support all the compiler attributes for core and all the compiler built-ins. Um, and core is now also enabled by default when you build a BPF program with GCC, provided that you enable debug info, minus G. Something other recent thing that we changed is that GCC now generates BTF by default when you specify minus G. So minus G is actually documented in the GCC documentation and has been for ages that it, it enables whatever debugging format is the native debugging format of the platform you are compiling to. So it, this makes full sense. You can still in, enable DORF if you want it, or CTF as well. So all the debugging formats that GCC supports. Um, all right. Now, I hate to say this, but now GCC emits the pseudo C assembly syntax, which I despise with my full soul, and I think it's a terrible idea. It's a bad thing, but I have no choice. Have no choice, but I don't give up. I'm not giving up. So, um, well, for, for practical reasons, I mean, the kernel has a lot of header files that BPF programs have to use, and uh, they have uh, inline assembly using this despicable thing, syntax. So, okay, we, we give up, but we don't. The war is not over. The battle may be lost, but not the war. Okay, so now GCC uses it by default, which because otherwise everyone will need to specify an extra option for GCC, and that's not kind, and we want to be kind to people, to users, yeah? What else? Um, we did what Clang is doing as well, which is that when GCC finds a built-in mem move mem copy or mem set, um, in normal targets, basically, when GCC cannot, doesn't know how to inline uh, those Building calls those operations into target uh, specific instructions, they generate what is something that is called a lib call. That lib call is a, like a, a function call to some function that usually is implemented in the compiler runtime libraries, like in libgcc.so, for example. In, this, in BPF, we cannot do that because we don't link. So, um, so basically, what we are doing now in GCC is what Clang does, which is that when it finds one of those built-ins, it, it, it is able to generate a verifier-friendly version of memcopy, memmove, memmove, and memset, and it just expands to those instructions. However, we found a problem with this, which is that if your memcopy, if you are going to memcopy a huge amount of bytes, and those verifier-friendly versions of memcopy and friends that the compiler generates, they don't have loops, because they are very fire friendly, it can ex explode into, I don't know, a huge thing, and GCC will be spinning there forever. So uh, David Faust, he added this option, minus M, M inline memops threshold, that you specify the man maximum number of bytes, and if the threshold is trespassed, then GCC gives you a nice compile time error, like, I cannot inline this because the buffer is too big. 
Uh, now, so the question is, uh, what do you think about this in Clang as well? Like supporting the same option. Oh. What happens in Clang if you do a memcopy with a huge uh, buffer? Clang already doing this in Lani, and, uh, but it has a, a default option already. Basically, there's no option. They have a hard-coded value. Okay. I think it's uh, 128, probably, something like that. Okay, well, if you ever want to support the option, probably using the same name probably will be okay. a good idea. Okay, thank you. What else? Um, so, I mean, this is probably a terrible idea, but <clears throat> on certain platforms, w would it be useful for GCC or Clang to admit bounded loop iterators to implement that if it exceeds a certain threshold? Obviously, it wouldn't work just as like generic BPF instructions, but. If you're on a platform that actually can use loops that way, would it be useful? Sorry, what, what, what do you mean with platforms? Like, so on Linux, if you're running on a new enough kernel, you can, there are constructs to do like for loops from zero to whatever. Could the, could the compiler emit um, instructions to like iterate in a loop to do this mem copy instead of doing But would that pass the verifier? Yes. Oh, well, yeah, we can make it smarter, sure. Okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, it's, and it's weird because it would depend on, you know, like not every platform has bounded loop iterators and this is just Oh, I see. Just, yeah. but, oh, but by platform you mean like targets for which, to which you did the BPF? Yeah, yes, exactly. Like so, no. so um, Windows doesn't have it, you know, I mean, I guess, I don't know if Windows is using GCC, but the point is like bounded loop iterators is a feature of the BPF ecosystem. It's not like an instruction. So it would depend on where you're running to be able ah, to Ah, okay, use so it. it will depend on if it is the Linux kernel or if it is the whatever Windows thing or, right? Yeah, so okay. Like, yeah. It requires BTF. I guess, like that, so. I mean, mm, most of GCC targets, they have like operating system mm, specific parts, definitions and so on. I'm not sure if BPF, like one verifier or another or one ecosystem or another will qualify something like an operating system or not, but if yeah. it did, sure. I mean, we don't care what we generate as long as it passes the verifier, honestly, and, and from compiler I, point of view. Maybe this is something that you implement in the program itself, like you use memcopy in a loop or something like that. So, I don't know, different options. I think we debated it, <clears throat> and in general, it's not a great idea for the compiler to emit <clears throat> calls to functions that may exist. Like memcopy could have been implemented long ago, even for old kernel, and just do this uh, probe read kernel. That's your memcopy right there, is a single but. It would assume that there is specific like helper exists with a specific ID, and on Windows it may be different. So like inlining, like either inline as a loop or just like emit the loop, like plain loop, and fingers crossed the verifier bounded loop logic today will deal with it. Sure, yeah. All right, so recently we found out that Clank is defining all those feature macros that we were not defining. So we basically added support for this. So there is this BPF CPU version that we are, um, we now just see the finds this. And then we implement support for those sets of feature macros, which basically tells the C program, the BPFC program, um, which features the compiler supports, or not just the compiler, also the assembler, like which instructions are available or not. Um, all those, all the ones related to V3, which is this ALU32, JAMP32, JAMP X, BSWAP, and so on, they can be, they are enabled with CPU V3 or higher, but also they have like uh, a specific um, options to enable or disable them. This is something that GCC traditionally supports for all these targets, so I mean, it's nice to have. And also we have those which are for V4 that I don't think we have specific flags, or I don't think so, but okay. Now, little question I had here, mm, those feature macros, uh, is this going to be part of the standardization? And in that case, where exactly? Because we, doc we should document those in the GCC manual, but I wonder if it would be better to just refer to some other source if it's going to be the same for Clang and for GCC. I don't know. I'll cover that in my presentation right after you. <laughs> okay, cool. So you are, you are touching the, the feature macros. You are talking about them. Okay, cool. 
Okay, so he said that, that yeah, that uh, wait for the next session. So I will wait. Okay. Um, now um, we just fixed something that uh, unfortunately was broken, which is that uh, we were emitting not the right thing for memory constraints. Okay. Now there is a, there is more stuff here, uh, but it's not uh, that interesting. So this is when it comes to the status. Now, the interesting part, the exciting part, quickly, in 10 minutes or less, or five minutes, where we are. So it took us years of work, but now finally, since yesterday, actually, since uh, Alexei pushed the last our last fixes for the BPF next, um, we can compile, GCC is able to compile all the, the self-tests in the kernel, all of them. And, um, when it comes to runtime, because one thing is to build a self-test, which is not little task, um, but then when you run them, uh, this is the current situation that we have. So there is 108 of them that fail. So I will say this is not that bad. Actually, we are sort of a little bit of surprised because, you know, I mean, it, lo it looks like GCC is actually generating code that can be verified, which is a good thing, I guess. We are lucky. Um, so this is the current status. This is an important milestone, because this means that now uh, we could have some sort of CI in the kernel. So now at least we won't be always like running after, you know, like, oh, some self-test may break GCC or something, right? So this is an important milestone. The next milestone, obviously, is to pass 100% of the, of the self-tests. And then at that point, then we will be able to say, okay, we are on par with Clang or LLVM. Short question, like, could we add this to the BPFCI, at least at the compilation? Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's, I think, will be the bigger value. A related question, logistical. Do you have some nightly packages that we can install on? Right, is that's, it Ubuntu this, is, this is coming now. I mean, so what is, what, what is the tool chain that is required for this to happen? So obviously, both Binutil masters and GCC master can be used. Now, other than that, what you will need to install in the machine is Binutils 242, which is the latest version of Binutils released, plus those seven patches that are upstream, but not in the release. This was released in January. Binutils 243, sorry, will become in June or in July. Yeah. Well, for, for Clank, we, we pull nightlies. From we JIT? Uh, no, no, no. Or they, 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 they publish nightly pre-built packages that right. install. So can we do something like that for GCC? Yeah, for GCC, yes. There are weekly snapshots. There are weekly tarballs which are generated. For Binutils, no. Okay. Yeah. So it will be Binutils 242, which is the latest release, plus back, those backports. And for GCC, I am very upset about this, but 14.1, which was released last week, uh, plus one fix that... I mean, which is this this problem here? Um, so we will. This is already master, but we will ask to backport it to the 14 maintenance uh, branch. So 14.2 probably is to be expected to be released the, the first back, back fix release of of this 14 around August. So now the questions that I had here is okay. I, I think we all agree to it. we want a CI for this, right? For the GCC build, for the compiled part, because I think it's, for now it's, it will be useless to look at the results on the runtime. A question that I had is that, do you think it would be a good idea to have test runners for CPU before and no ALU32 like Clang does, or is it not worth it? What do you think? I would say no. Let's test the latest one. Because like we we have no LU32 and like V3 versus V4 just to test like some regressions in verifier, you know. If we trust the GCC roughly emits the same instructions, probably, I don't know. It's not hard, but probably not. Okay. I mean, cool. Well, if you change your mind at some point, it's not that difficult to add a new test runner, so I guess. All right. So, yeah, I guess we can work with whom? With Yong Hong? to set up the CI, to set up the CI for GCC. We should work with you, I guess. Yes. Uh, I discussed with Manu and uh, in our team, and uh, yes, we could do that as long as we get the nightly build. Right. Yeah, we can do that. 
Okay, so um, about adoption and availability. Um, there are some upstream programs, user land programs that have BPF components. Not many, but some. And uh, we know that some of them actually support ECC BPF. One is the system D. System D distributes some BPF, uh, C BPF programs with it. And a few weeks ago, they were, well, they support GCC BPF. And actually, a few weeks ago, they fixed something, uh, some problem with some optimization or something. So the system D is covered upstream. So the next system D release uh, will support this. Uh, D-Trace as well. D-Trace is now being, it's, it was rewritten uh, to work on BPF instead of having its own interpreter. And since ever it's used, it's, it's been used, the GCC uh, compiler, BPF compiler, to compile all the support code that uh, uh, some libraries code that, that it distributes. Uh, Waldo, which is this little tool that, to be honest, I'm not pretty sure what it does, but it also supports GCC BPF. BPF trace, I'm not sure, because Daniel, I saw some GitHub, uh, yeah, uh, because I, I think BPF trace uses B, uh, um, BCC. Uh, the thing I was, I commented on, on like a GCC bugzilla thing, but that was like unrelated to um, BPF trace, kind of. Um, BPF trace links with uh, LLVM and just directly generates LLVM IR, so. Right, but it, so, but there must be some parts of it that make sense to use GCC BPF instead, or or not? Uh, I don't think so, right? Because okay, well, I'm just asking because I just saw. So um, okay, cool. So then I remove it. Okay. Um, One suggestion, just to increase the testing, like you can look at the BCC tools. They're called BCC tools, but I actually built using libpf, and so they have like the cbpf. Uh -huh. So you can look into compiling that. Okay. With just cbpf. Okay, I will. There are like 30, 40 different programs, so. Okay, cool. Because we need testing. I mean, we need uh, things to compile, yeah. Okay, so now, what is, how it's looking in the distro, at the distro level, distributions, yeah. I mean, I mean if you want suggestions, and Cilium is also one, you can compile the, the BPF programs from there. Cilium. Sorry again. I didn't uh, so, like, if you're looking for additional programs to uh, to compile, right? Like, uh, Cilium would be another one you could. Try. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we should make a list. Um, and for Cilium case, uh, we have several cases uh, for Cilium and for Tetragon, where Clank generates uh, code which is not verified properly. So we have hacks to fight with this. Yeah. And it would be interesting yeah. to see. Uh, like how GCC acts in the same cases. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, we have to follow up on this, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so Debian. Um, in this, this, okay, first, Oracle Linux, which makes sense. So f regarding distros, first, in Oracle Linux, we support, we have fully backported GCC BPF support in OL8 and in OL9. So in all the platforms that Oracle Linux supports. Um, so it, it has the crosses in them. Debian, um, you can see what you see in the, in the screen. So basically, of, of the one in a stable is not usable. This is 12.2. It's it, it will not generate anything that you can actually use in practice. But the one in testing and in unstable, in, in unstable, this is basically, those are the nightly snapshots that GCC generates the GCC project, and Doco, he's basically getting those and keeping the Debian and Ubuntu packages always up to date to those. Not always, but he knows because he follows the development in GCC upstream and he knows exactly where to pick those things up. So in Debian and Ubuntu, this is the Debian, this is the Ubuntu, um, the support is latest and complete. In Gento, um, they are working on it. There is here you see the URL for a pull request for it. So they are right now they are working on adding the crosses uh, for BPF as well. I think they are they they are planning to or they are working on adding them this in a very similar way that the, the way that the MinGV32 cross tools are available in Gento, but for BPF. 
So with this, we cover Oracle Linux, we cover Debian and derivatives, because the derivatives like Dev1 and many other derivatives are getting the same crosses, and Gento. Uh, Fedora and RHEL, for the moment, they don't support, uh, don't ship the crosses, but we are also working to try to get them packaging it. Yeah, yeah I, sh I should shut up, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, ah, but it's just in time. Perfect. Okay. So, the next part, which is the next work, is David Faust. 